Welcome everyone to episode 52 of Ohio Unsolved. I'm your host Matthew, and I've got a crazy one for you guys today. The 1977 Girl Scout murders. Such a tragic story, but one that people still need to hear about to help and make others safe. So let's just get right into the episode. Everyone sit back, make sure to lock your doors and windows, and get ready for Ohio Unsolved. Our first story is a little graphic, so listener discretion is advised. On June 12, 1977, 140 girls, including Denise Milner, Michelle Goose, and Lori Farmer, arrived at Camp Scott for a two-week stay. The campsite is located near Locust Grove, Oklahoma, about 50 miles away from Tulsa. The three girls were between the ages of 8 and 10. Although they did not know each other beforehand, they were all assigned to tent number 8 in Camp Kiowa. This tent in particular was the farthest from camp counselors. As there was a thunderstorm that night, the girls spent the evening writing letters to their parents before going off to bed. No one could have known the horror that was to come. In the dead of night, several counselors reported hearing moans throughout the campgrounds. When one of them got up to investigate, the noises stopped, and so she went back to bed. The next morning, the counselor, Carla Wilhite, got up bright and early and encountered a grisly scene. According to the counselor, she found the lifeless bodies of Milner, Goose, and Farmer. All three Girl Scouts had been sexually assaulted, while Goose and Farmer were bludgeoned to death. Milner was strangled. The tent was covered in blood, and the girls' bodies had been stuffed into their sleeping bags and left outside in the woods. Police were immediately called to the scene, where they uncovered even more disturbing details. Rope, a crowbar, duct tape, and a flashlight with a partial fingerprint were found near the girls' bodies. In addition, police were able to take DNA samples from the scene. When investigators spoke to camp counselors, they were informed that only two months before this tripled homicide, a distressing event had occurred. During training, one counselor's tent had been rifled through and a note had been left. It stated, We are on a mission to kill three girls in Tent 1. This was thought to be a cruel joke, and it was disregarded. As for the three girls, Goose and Farmer had been more than excited to attend camp. Milner, however, was having second thoughts and high levels of anxiety about leaving home. She decided against going, but ultimately her mother had convinced her to attend. With all the physical evidence and claims of strange noises throughout the night, many believed the murders would be solved without a hitch, but this was not the case. Investigators, however, did have a suspect in mind, Gene Leroy Hart. Police dogs found a cave near the campsite that had items belonging to both the camp 
and to Jean. Also, someone had written, The killer was here. Bye bye, fools. 61777 on another cave nearby. Only four years earlier, the convict had broken out of prison and had been on the run ever since. Hart was a Cherokee man who had kidnapped and assaulted two pregnant women. He was convicted of these crimes and sent to jail. However, he escaped in 1973. He possibly hid inside the cave because it was near his childhood home. In addition, it's believed that members of the local community was sheltering the fugitive. After being at large for years, Hart was finally found on April 6, 1978. He was subsequently charged with the murders of Milner, Goose, and Farmer. The evidence against him was very compelling. His previous victims had noticed, noted that he had used nylon rope and duct tape on them both. Both of those things were found near the girls' bodies. Some of the duct tape had hair that did not belong to the victims. Furthermore, they stated that Hart had made strange noises. Their descriptions matched what the counselors had heard the night of the murder. Several pairs of glasses had gone missing from the campsite, and one of them was later found inside the cave. However, those around Hart believed him to be innocent of the murders. They believed that he was a scapegoat and that the investigator's actions were racially motivated. Hart's trial began on March 19, 1979. The local Cherokee Nation fully supported him and provided him funds for his defense. The prosecution brought up the glasses, the duct tape, and other items discovered in and around the cave as evidence of his guilt. They also presented biological evidence, including the hair found on the duct tape and semen found on the girls' bodies. Despite this, Hart's defense team fought back furiously. They stated that the evidence had been planted and that the DNA was confounded. The defense claimed that a footprint found near the crime scene was too small to be Hart's, and that a fingerprint on the, on the flashlight was not his. Furthermore, they stated that the hair on the duct tape could not be proven to be his. As this was the late 70s, the DNA could not be tested, and thus the defense said that the semen did not belong to him. In the end, Hart was found not guilty of the Girl Scout murders. He did, however, return to prison to serve his time for his previous crimes. Hart died on June 4, 1979, in the Oklahoma State Penitentiary from a heart attack. Despite his acquittal, many, including investigators, felt that he had got away with murder. Ultimately, it seems that the jury was swayed by the defense in believing that he had been racially profiled. Although he had been found guilty of other violent crimes, his funeral was later attended by thousands. Camp Scott, which had opened in 1928, closed down a day after the deaths of the three young girls. In 1989, the DNA from the case was tested and found that three of the five probes matched hearts. While this could not fully prove that he was the killer, it couldn't rule him out either. DNA was tested in 2008, but the results were undetermined due to the state of the DNA. Partial female DNA was found during this testing, but it was inconclusive. They cannot figure out who it belonged to. Other names have been thrown around throughout the years, and it's also been theorized that Hart had an accomplice. This case, however, remains open and unsolved as of 2022. I really hope that he was the man that did it, because then he was in prison for the rest of his life. Such a horrible thing to do to three innocent girls who still had full lives to live. 
I hope that they had the right man in custody and that the real killer isn't still out there somewhere. Our next story comes from my favorite website. As always, I will be reading from the author's perspective. When I was a young child, the best thing in the world was waking up early on Saturday morning for cartoons. At 6 o'clock on Saturday, the first thing they would show was Mr. Peppermint along with his right-hand puppet muffin, and after that was over, they would start showing the good stuff like He-Man and Transformers. Clearly, I was a child in the era of good cartoons before Pokemon took over the world. The child in me loves to sleep, and I was no different when I really was a child. But I loved my cartoons, and I would wake up early with, without an alarm clock on Saturday to partake. One morning, this ritual placed me in a strange situation, coming face to face with something in a rear bedroom of our house. Being the first person awake that morning, and being only five or six years old at the time, being stealthy was important, because if mom or dad caught me, they would send me back to bed, and I would miss some of my favorite shows. I remember getting out of bed, and creeping down the hallway to our front room where the television was located turning on the TV and finding the right channel for Mr. Peppermint to be doing this thing. I watched Mr. Peppermint and Muffin argue for a few minutes, and I then heard a soft noise coming from the rear of the house. I don't know why, but I went back down the hall towards my bedroom, but I did and I looked further down the hall towards an unused bedroom at the very end. I thought that I had heard something moving in there, and since I did have a small dog, I thought maybe he was in there. I walked into the darkened room, and to my horror, I saw a bright green mass with a face floating above the furniture in the room. My parents had been using this room for storage since me and my brother were at the time young enough to share a bedroom. The mass turned towards me, and half a and had this startled expression as if I had scared him. I assumed from the face that it was a male, but after all these years, I don't remember specifics about the face. I ran from my bedroom and I got back in bed and I did what all little kids do when they are terrified, and I pulled the covers over my head. If you pull the covers over your head, it stops any monsters from being able to touch you through your blanket force field. I stayed there for hours until I heard my parents get up, and they asked me if I had turned on the TV because it was still on in the living room. This is how I know that I really did get up out of bed and I was not dreaming because I had turned on the television. I don't know what I saw that morning, but it was not mean or dangerous, it was just there and appeared afraid of me. Our final story is also from YourGhostStories.com, and is about a non-human entity. I was only 15 when we moved to this old-fashioned house in the province. Everyone was very hospitable and happy. I was wondering about how they can live so simple when everything could be more exciting. I became interested in their lifestyle, and I started talking and asking about anything that came to mind, until my uncle started to tell me, you should always be careful and aware of your surroundings, because this is a new place for you, and you are a new face for everyone in this town. I don't get what he meant, but I just agreed and moved on. One night, as I was about to fall asleep, I heard a weird noise. It sounded like a big cat scratching on the wall of the room, with long, sharp claws. I was so pissed that I couldn't sleep because of that. I slammed a book into the wall and it made a big noise that, dis that disturbed my sister. But the noise stopped. My room is located beside big trees. When you look out of the window, you'll see a farm and feel the fresh air. 
so I thought it's just one of those animals who likes to fool around at night with those weird noises. In the morning, I told my parents about it, but they didn't care much. The next night, the scratching started again. My little sister was scared, because now it's constantly changed places. But it did not stop, even again when I slammed the book to the where the sound was coming from. By the way, the house was made of thick old wood. Everything can be heard from the ground up to the second floor, especially when someone's wearing high heels. It is an antique house that has big windows where two people can jump out of it when it's open and hardwood doors. Some parts of the house need to be fixed and walls need to be changed before it collapses. My parents' room is in the other side, so probably they cannot hear anything, so much because of the toilet and another room that sits between us. The weird sound continues, and it seems like whatever the purpose of the scratching, I felt it can actually make a hole. The idea made me nervous, so we went to our parents' room, then I woke them up. My dad checked every corner of the room and assumed that it might be a big rat or something and that the noise had already stopped before he could actually hear it so he did not pay any more attention to it. We stayed the night in our parents room for four nights in a row. Then the day where my parents visited an old friend from a different town so I invited my two friends to sleep over with my younger sister and I to help keep us company. I told them the story about the scratching, and they were excited to hear that, and planned to catch the so-called cat or rat that night. At around 10 p.m., we started preparing to call it a night after watching three movies and talking. Then they remembered the plan and started getting some sort of weapons like a knife, a baseball bat, and an ice pick. I chose the baseball bat for it's just for scaring the creature. I don't like killing any animal for that matter. So we placed the weapons beside us. My little sister was not so excited, so she went to sleep and didn't want to have anything to do with us. We were getting sleepy when the noise started. I whispered to my friends, do you hear that? That's it. They are both quiet, trying to figure out what kind of animal is making that weird noise. It's not a cat or a rat. This time, it's making the scratching deeper. I woke up my sister, and I asked her to move because I'm going to throw big books on that side where she was sleeping, because that's where it was. I got all three of the big encyclopedia books, and I slammed them at that side of the wall. I was shocked by the noise it made, but more petrified by what we found. It was so shocked by the slamming, we heard it spread its wings and fly. My friend said, this is not good. What kind of bird would do this? As I remember, birds stay where they cannot be invaded. But why this one comes back every night? You know what? I don't think this is an animal. My friend went to the kitchen and got us salt and garlic. He said that it might be helpful. We went to sleep, and we got disturbed again by the scratching. I checked the time, and it was 3 a.m. I woke everyone up. It's here again. My little sister was sleeping beside me, and I didn't want to wake her up, so I just carried her and moved her to the sofa bed near the closed door and window. My friend starts cursing the creature, telling it that we are not afraid. If it will be able to come inside the house, we will not stop until it bleeds to death. That's a strategy to send a message that we are not afraid. But honestly, I don't understand what it is, but I am too afraid to open any window to check because we are trying to stay safe inside the house until morning, and the windows are too big. Until now, I get shivers down my spine when I remember this. We continue making noises and swearing to it, and then it stops for a while. And I thought it's finished, just like the same, 
the previous nights. But to my horror, it started scratching the window next to my sister. And it's like it wants to fold the window with its bare hands and claws. I was too scared to see if the window was actually moving and forced to be open from the outside. I hit the window again and again and didn't know what else to do. My sister was now crying and she said that she had a nightmare that an old lady with very ugly makeup was pulling her out of that window with her big hand and long nails. That's when my friends and I were convinced that this was not an ordinary bird or cat. I got the phone, called my parents, and I asked them to come home immediately. I didn't have the courage to tell them the details yet, so I just hung up the phone. All of us did not sleep. We sat all together at the far corner where we can breathe. It was still scratching, trying to get near my sister, but we put the salt and garlic around her. I don't know why, but I guess it helps a little because it didn't know where to scratch anymore. When our parents arrived, we were all exhausted. We tried to convince them about it, but of course, for them, it was nonsense. My uncle checked my room and asked me about it. He checked the walls, nothing. He went out and he got a ladder and checked the walls outside. Bingo. There are the marks of the scratching, very deep and it looks like a mark of an angry tiger or beast. Then my parents were convinced. My uncle reminded me to be careful because this is not just for us. Something could find us very interesting and would like to test if we are useful or not. I think now I understand what he's trying to say. I don't expect anyone to believe me because I know this is very impossible. Also, I apologize if my English is poor because I live in the Philippines. Well, that is going to do it for today. I hope that everyone enjoyed the stories, and if you could, please rate and review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. A five-star rating really helps others to find this podcast. Don't forget to join us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe on YouTube. If you are a fan of the show, please consider helping to support the show by subscribing on Patreon with monthly bonus episodes starting at the $5 tier. The new this month's bonus episode was scheduled to come out today, but it will be out tomorrow. Once again, thank you all for listening, and make sure to keep those doors and windows locked. And stay ready for Ohio Unsolved.